Hello, and thank you for joining me. We're talking about Chapter 11 from Kentora Atel 2020, the Asia Pacific region. We've got six learning objectives associated with this chapter. We're talking about the dynamic growth across Asia Pacific. We're talking about the importance and slow growth of Japan, the importance of bottom of the pyramid markets and diversity across the Asia Pacific region. We're also addressing the interrelationships among countries within Asia Pacific, and we're recognizing the diversity with, within China. All right, so in 1993, estimates by the International Monetary Fund uh, suggested that Asian, Asian economies would have 29% of the global output by the year 2000. And those estimates were accurate. However, what happened starting in 1996, leading economies of Asia, and we're talking about Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan, they experienced a serious financial crisis, which resulted in the crash of the Asian stock market. And this had the effect of tight monetary policy and appreciating dollar uh, deceleration of exports, uh, all contributing to the downturn. Despite this Asian stock market crash, however, um, Asia, was or is the fastest growing region in the world. Actually, it has the fastest growth for the last 30 years and the prospects for continued growth are excellent. And what this means for international marketers is a source of new products, new technology and vast consumer markets. When we're focused on the greater China, part of Asia Pacific, we're actually referring to two separate political units that divided in 1949. This is the People's Republic of China, mainland China, and then there's Taiwan, or referred to as the Republic of China. <laughs> What's interesting here is that both has claimed the other as their territory and um, Politically, the situation is quite difficult. Militarily, it's quite dangerous. And these situations persist. There has, however, been more direct trade between the two um, parts of China uh, in this century. And that has helped ease some historical tension in East Asia. So when we're talking about the People's Republic of China, we need to recognize that China is the most important national market aside from the US. There are dramatic economic and social changes happening in China. Um, events in 2000 had profound effect on China's economy. And these included admission to the World Trade Organization and the US granting permanent normal trade relations to China. Now, considering China, we need to think of China as a group of regions rather than a single country. And this is because of China's diversity, the geographic size, and the political organization of this group of regions. The People's Republic of China is fast emerging as a competitor in global markets, a competitor to watch, but they must overcome some issues to reach their full potential. Issues such as human rights and the legal system within China are major issues for them to deal with in order to reach their full potential. Now, because they're fast emerging economy, environmental decline is associated with this fast growth. There's also the one child policy and the demographic disaster associated with that government policy um, and the discrimination against those moving from rural 
to urban areas. China actually has an urbanizational poli urbanization policy where they are deliberately moving people from rural areas into more highly dense, um, highly densely populated urban areas, and people are experiencing discrimination. It's it's making new market opportunities because people in newly urban areas are, of course, consuming and changing their lifestyle. And uh, but it's also resulting in discrimination. Okay, so we can't talk about China at the moment without talking about the coronavirus. And um, this map here shows the spread of the coronavirus that uh, was first reported in Wuhan, China in December 2019. This coronavirus is an infectious respiratory disease and it's spread rapidly within China, and but it's also spread to many countries around the world. The rapid growth, the rapid spread of the disease, um, we're talking about now since December, we're in February, uh, we're talking about more than 76,000 confirmed cases, more than 2,500 deaths in China, and there are at least 655 cases around the world. The US has 15 confirmed cases currently. Okay, so of course this has an economic impact throughout the world. There's fewer Chinese tourism throughout the world. And here we're looking at a graph that shows the economic exposure to Chinese tourism in Asia. So the viral outbreak has actually revealed that several Southeast Asian countries are heavily dependent on Chinese tourism. Travel bans and restrictions have bottled up the flow of tourists since the Lunar New Year holiday. So tourism related industries such as transportation and hospitality have been hit particularly hard. Now, the impact will be felt most acutely by Thailand, which has already been contending with a sluggish economy due to an aging population and a weak domestic investment. But other Southeast Asian countries will also be infected, affected, not infected, <laughs> maybe infected as well. In and, and so other Southeast Asian countries such as Indonesia, the Philippines and Vietnam have a high dependence on Chinese tourism and from other countries more generally. And that means that the outbreak, outbreak will have a deep impact on their um, national economies. So China's economic footprint on the world is much bigger now, that it, now than it was nearly 20 years ago. When SARS hit in 2002 and 2003, China was a source of 8% of all the manufacturing goods exported worldwide. By 2018, this figure had ballooned to 19%, as we see in this graph. So in a lopsided fashion, the world has actually become more dependent on China economically, even as China has become less dependent on the rest of the world. Many countries now import more Chinese-made intermediate goods, which they then use as components to make finished goods and then shipped overseas. And what that means is that any disruption to Chinese manufacturing supply chains often create enormous global domino effects. So the coronavirus outbreak and the resulting quarantines have disrupted many supply chains involving China. For example, the huge electronics manufacturer Foxconn, which makes Apple iPhones, resumed, they actually shut down production for a few weeks and then they resumed on February 10, but only to a limited scale. So China 
we can envisage China now as like the workshop of the world. China has actually held its own economic vulnerability with regards other countries well in check. Across many manufacturing sectors, the country has managed to remain increasingly self-sufficient. So China now imports fewer intermediate goods from the rest of the world by vertically integrating supply chains, except in the case of some raw materials like oil and certain high-tech goods such as semiconductors. If we look at the auto industry specifically in China, China actually is pressing Chinese bureaucrats to buy locally branded cars. The market share of Chinese brands in the automobile industry has plummeted from more than 65% in 2000, the year 2000, to just 45% currently. And why is this the case? Well, European brands hold about 20% of the market, Japanese hold about 15%, American 11%, Korean cars, 8%. So Volkswagen, which puts out the Audi auto brand, the Audi luxury sedans, pictured here. Um, it's actually pictured outside the Nationals People's Congress. Audi, or Volkswagen, dominates market share among the foreign brands, followed by Hyundai and Toyota. But almost all foreign companies are deeply involved in joint ventures with Chinese partners. Okay, we've talked about China, let's talk about Hong Kong. Hong Kong ruled by the British for 155 years, but then was handed back to China in 1997. And it became a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China one country, two systems. So Hong Kong has a very strong economy, a freely converted dollar, foreign exchange, security markets, and the stock market is the primary source of capital for some of China's largest state-owned enterprises. Turning now to Taiwan, otherwise known as the Republic of China. So the one China debate happens inside a bundle of more concrete issues, such as establishing three direct links between transportation, trade and communications. The three, tra the three direct links issue must be faced before each country has joined the World Trade Organization. And the rules insist that members communicate about trade disputes and other issues. So trade fits well with both countries' needs. Taiwanese companies face rising costs, however. China offers nearly limitless pool of cheap labor and engineering talent, while Taiwan's tech powerhouses also crave access to China's markets. Let's talk about Japan. Japan enjoyed fast growth in the 70s and 80s, but their economy slowed abruptly in the 1990s and they're currently heading for recession with a negative growth rate of 6.3%. We can flag four possible explanations for this. Faulty economic policies, inept political apparatus, disadvantages due to global circumstances and cultural inhibitions. And of course, now we have to add the coronavirus to this list. When we're talking about faulty economic policies in Japan, what we're talking about is the stock market crash in the 90s that lasted the whole decade for Japan. Some think the nation became overconfident and so we're making risky bets with their finances. 
they've got what is referred to as a one party sickness in Japan. So the government is controlled by bureaucracy. And global circumstances have not served Japan well. We've seen a decline in consumer purchasing power. There was the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that had long lasting economic impacts. And I was actually in Tokyo just three months prior to that tsunami. Um, that's another story, I'll tell you that in class. <laughs> Um, there was increased demand for oil imports resulting from destruction of energy infrastructure and that has caused a trade deficit. The Japanese population is shrinking and currently there's almost a third of the Japanese population that is 65 years or older. More specifically, in Japan, there are 2.3 billion people in their 70s. And another reason why global circumstances have um, hurt Japan is because of the complexity of the Japanese language. Here we've got a graph showing the um, aging population across several nations. But you can see that Japan is well ahead with uh, uh, more than 25% currently uh, at that aged group, 65 years or older. And that's well ahead of Italy, Portugal, Germany and Finland, for example. Considering the cultural um, Uh, issue with regards to Japan's problems, challenges, um, they actually did a really good job of unifying their manufacturing after World War II and this very much helped with their national recovery after the Second World War. Because what happened was that they came together uh, with a common goal, a common national goal. And um, uh, the cultural value of structure meant that their emphasis on structure did not help them adapt quickly enough to a globalised marketplace, globalised competition. All right, let's talk about India. India, India gained independence in um, 1950, but, it's, but it had poor economic growth for many years and that growth was constrained by traditional insular policies. They had import substitutions as well as an aversion to free markets. They had anti-business attitudes and widespread corruption. But India has embarked on profound transformation. There's many efforts to become active in the global economy, and this has been recognised for many years by people around the world watching India's growth. And there has been an information technology boom in India, and many com Indian companies are expanding internationally. They actually have a five-point agenda. And this five point agenda is um, about improving the investment climate, developing a comprehensive world trade organization strategy, reforming agriculture, food processing, and, food processing and small scale industry, uh, dissolving red tape and improving corporate governance. Now, along the way to making this happen, they have actually taken some steps already. They've been privatising state-owned organisations as opposed to merely selling shares in them. 
And the government is now willing to reduce its take below 51% and to give management control to strategic investors. In the telecommunications sector, uh, regulation uh, has been demolishing the monopolies uh, enjoyed by state-owned enterprises, and they've signed a trade agreement with the US to lift quantitative restrictions on imports. So this has maintained a momentum in the reform taking place in India and particularly in the petroleum sector. So they've been planning the opening of domestic long distance phone services, housing, real estate and retail trade sectors. Um, they've been uh, planning the opening of these sectors to foreign direct investment. But the difficult business environment in India continues to comprise high tariffs, inadequate protection for intellectual property, the anti-business attitudes persist, and um, maybe we can ask some of our Indian classmates to comment on that point. As, and also persisting is the widespread corruption and bribery in India. So within Indian industry, we see much of protectionism policies being implemented. In the biotech industry, for example, world-class scientists in the Indian pharmaceutical industry uh, doesn't necessarily benefit from innovations and international investments compared with more open emerging economies such as China. And India being left behind China does not fare well for India. All right. Now, if we're talking about the dynamic growth in Asia Pacific, we have to talk about the Asian tigers. These are Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan. These four Asian tigers are rapidly industrializing and extending their trading activity to other parts of Asia. Japan was once a dominant uh, leader in the area and was once a key player in the economic development of um, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong and South Korea, uh, other countries too. But as the economies of other Asian countries have strengthened and industrialized, they're actually becoming more important and uh, stronger economic leaders than Japan. For example, South Korea is the center of trade links with North China and the Asian republics of the former Soviet Union. South Korea's sphere of influence and trade extends to the Guangdong and Fujian um, areas, which are two of the most productive Chinese special economic zones, and they're becoming more important in interregional investment as well. Let's talk about Vietnam. So after the Vietnam War, the Vietnamese economy and infrastructure was flattened. Uh, but the country is actually enjoying significant growth at the moment, partly because um, of the bilateral trade agreement with the US, which um, the US tariffs on Vietnamese imports were dropped significantly. Uh, their population of 91 million is becoming more educated and highly entrepreneurial. And their government, the Vietnamese government, is committed to economic growth. Here we're looking at Vietnam, Vietnam's dependence on Chinese trade. Um, countries like Vietnam are highly dependent on Chinese capital and intermediate goods, and that's leaving them scrambling in the face of the coronavirus. Uh, so this 
um, global pandemic, global emergency as deemed by the World Health Organization will be a tough challenge for Asia Pacific and particularly Vietnam. Um, and especially so with regards to uh, sectors in which China has larger market shares, such as electronics and automobiles. So now this next slide shows us the projected economic impact of the coronavirus across Asia Pacific. And this graph projects the damage that Southeast Asian countries will have to weather if 20% of Chinese manufacturing were to be, remain closed down for a full quarter. So if the factories were to fully reopen in one month, the impact will be much less. But as I've flagged on the previous slide, Vietnam will be affected the most due to its high dependence on Chinese supply chains. Um, what's working in Vietnam's favour, however, is their 7% growth rate recorded in 2019. So that provides a partial buffer. Meanwhile, the impact on the economies of Hong Kong and Singapore will be more severe should China manufacturing remain shut down. They're, and these countries were already experiencing a slow pace of growth due to their structural weaknesses even before the coronavirus um, came about. All right, now, Vietnam. Very few cars in Vietnam, many motorbikes, and motorbikes deliver everything, including mooncakes in Hanoi. So I've got a picture of the mooncakes here. Not sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> Again, we'll defer to our Vietnamese uh, classmates. But the mooncakes are an indispensable delicacy enjoyed during the mid-autumn festival, which is a traditional fet festival of the Vietnamese. It's held on the 15th day of August and it's based on the lunar calendar. It's the occasion when all members of the family gather to celebrate, as well as spend precious times together before getting back to their busy, busy work lives, busy, hectic schedules. And the moon cake is symbolic among family members um, about the completeness and unity of family. So delivery of the moon cakes is actually a special event in Vietnam. All right, bottom of the pyramid markets. This is my area of research. So Prelahard introduced the concept of bottom of the pyramid markets. We're talking about 4 billion people with an annual income below $1,200. Historically, this consumer group has been ignored because of the perceived lack of resources of both money and technology. And there's also this misconception about inappropriateness of products and services typically developed for affluent consumers. But the point is that bottom of the pyramid markets deserve just as much attention as the affluent markets. And these bottom of the pyramid markets are now viewed as commercially viable. And uh, they have a high entrepreneurial spirit and microfinancing with the Grameen Group in India, for example, have done very well. So industries have been shown to evolve with external support, such as the microfinancing provided by Grameen. Here we've got a picture of the streets of Old Delhi in India. And uh, recently <laughs> the speed limit was raised from 80 kilometres an hour to 100 kilometres an hour. Uh, it's a bit scary. Anyway, the centerpiece of that policy, that infrastructure construction, was um, 3,650 miles of a highway that links uh, Mumbai, oh, Delhi, Mumbai, 
Chennai and Kolkata. And uh, it is the most expensive public works project in the nation's history. Um, but I wonder how are the traffic police going to keep up uh, if the um, if the they have to be able to keep the sacred cows off the expressway and then they've got an increased speed limit and then all this traffic congestion. Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand, but all right, we'll move on. All right, so the the point of the story to, to this point in um, the chapter is that Asia Pacific is doing really well regardless of the coronavirus, regardless of the other challenges. And so they have to prepare for the next economic leap. Countries that were once dependent on the US and European markets, um, their growth is being driven by trade, investment, technology and aid um, provided by others in the region. And they do have some trade agreements in place. All right, so let's look at these trade agreements. There's three of them. We're talking about the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, these guys had problems unifying economies of the member nations because all the members once had similar products and resources to export. So it was like, okay, how's it going to be mutually beneficial, for example? So the inter-region trade was hampered, no demand for common products, and um, most early growth for this region came from outside of the Southeast Asian nations. But now they've stuck with it, and now they have the fastest growing economies in the region. Uh, four causes of vigorous economic growth for members government's commitment to deregulation, liberalisation and privatisation of their economies. They decided to shift economies from commodity-based to manufacturing-based and they made a decision to specialise in manufacturing components in which they have a competitive, comparative advantage. And what that did was create more diversity in their industrial output and increased opportunities for trade. Now, Japan's emergence as a major provider of technology and capital uh, necessary to upgrade manufacturing capability and develop new industries. So good for Japan in that sense. Then we've got the ASEAN Plus Three Association. This was created after the financial crisis of 97 and 98 and it was created because East Asia felt let down when the West did not help them so much during the crisis. They wanted to become more self-sufficient. So as well as the Southeast Asian nations, they added China, Japan and South Korea. So there was foreign and finance ministers from each country appointed to the association and they meet after the annual ASEAN meeting. Their common goal is to protect the Asian currency from future attack and there are talks of creating a common market across all of Asia. The third Asia-Pacific Trade Association is APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. This was formed in 1989 and it includes all major economies around the Pacific Rim plus the US and Canada. It provides a formal structure for discussion of goals. Um, so they talk about free and open trade and increased economic collaboration. They formalize the structure to sustain regional growth and development, strengthen multilateral trading system and reduce the barriers to investment and trade without detriment to the other economies. All right, now we're going to talk about the diversity within China. There are mutually competitive 
complementary economic warring states in China. And we can recognize four unique regional economies in China. Northeast China is the industrial heartland of China. Then there's the Beijing Taijin IT corridor. And we've also got the Shanghai and the Yangtze River Delta. And then there's the Pearl River Delta. So the diversity within China is region based and the strategic choices of each of these regions impact performance across China, of course. Here we've got a map of Greater China. And we're highlighting um, these different regions and the diversity of China within China. So we started out the chapter by saying it's better to consider China as a group of regions and this color coding shows. Um, Northeast China, long time industrial heartland and um, it's the technical center of the country as of the 70s and the 80s, but it's not as dominant now. It's uh, the greater industrial growth is actually in other regions. Um, Northeast China uh, caused, um, well, they shifted from communism to more free trade orientation. And the Northeast China proximity to industrial neighbours is a regional advantage. And what that means is that goods and ideas flow from Japan, South Korea and Russia. In the Beijing Taijin area, we're talking about 35 million people, hosts of thousands of IT and high tech companies. They've got a quality higher education system and their central planning has made it a center of two things. One, politics, two, research and development. In Shanghai and the Yangtze River Delta, we're talking about a major industrial renaissance over the past 20 years. They've seen a decline in textile and heavy manufacturing industries, but they've seen an increase in automobile and other high tech industries. So Shanghai is a regional trade and financial center. It's aided by China's economic growth and ascension to the World Trade Organization. But this area, specifically the Yangtze River Delta, provides a broad base of industries and economic resources. In the Pearl River Delta region, we're talking about very large cities, including Hong Kong. Shenzhen leads the economy of the region, and that's a boomtown bordering Hong Kong. It's China's first special economic zone as of 1980, and the population in this region has grown from 300,000 in 1980 to currently 7 million. So this Pearl River Delta is a manufacturing base for a wide range of industries. Now, there's another billion um, in China. They receive about 10% of central government budget, but that amounts to less than $100 per person for roads, water, power, schools and hospitals. So the economic divide within China continues to widen. There's political unrest in countryside that flares up because of this uh, increasingly uh, economic divide. And there's poor infrastructure that also causes challenges for distributors. So organizations actually have to be very resourceful to do well in China. When we're recognizing this diversity within China, there's differences in business negotiation styles across the regions. The Northeastern negotiators are more forthright, off, honest and plain spoken. 
Whereas in the Beijing area, it's more bureaucratic. They have more of an imperialist perspective and they're not as creative. In Shanghai, they're very shrewd, outgoing. They're big talkers and big spenders and they're more creative. Whereas in the Pearl River Delta, the entrepreneurship spirit is strong. They are honest and forthright. In Hong Kong, we're talking about mostly a bilingual um, business negotiation style that has elements of humility and indirection that's not evident across the greater China.